nation's favourite antiques experts. That's me. I like that. Behind the wheel of a classic car. Hold on. <laughs> and a goal to scar Britain for antiques. <laughs> on guard. The aim to make the biggest profit at auction. But it's no mean feat. I can't believe it. There'll be worthy winners <laughs> yes. and valiant losers. Okay, I was robbed. Will it be the high road to glory? Right, come on, let's go. Or the slow road to disaster? Oh, road. Ah! Oh, road. This is the Antiques Road Trip. Nice. Today's adventure starts out in one of our leafiest counties and features a couple of our best behaved experts. Morning. Morning. Yes, that's that nice Raj Bisram at the wheel. Seeing Surrey with this awfully nice, polite chum, Paul Martin. I'm so pleased we're in a convertible, Raj. Well, on a day like today, Paul, and it's lovely, isn't it? Indeed. Our men with the manners and the 1980s Mercedes are on the second leg of their road trip together. And so far, relations are about as affable as possible. We have a beautiful country, don't we? Yes, yes, we do. And we're seeing most of it. Take it away, Raj. <laughs> Lordy. Paul from Wiltshire. Wow. Is a dealer making his debut. Although, as you can see, he does have a very familiar TV face. While Kent's own Raj, an auctioneer, is a road trip regular. He even has a catchphrase. We've got a deal. And at their first auction, it was Raj who took a healthy lead. <laughs> Big smile. Although ruthless competition won't make them any less friendly to each other, I'm sure. Well, the sun's shining, Raj. I've got a smile on my face, even though I'm about five pounds, 30-odd pence down <laughs> so far. <laughs> That's the spirit. Paul began with £200 and, like the man said, now has £194.70. While Raj, who also started out with 200 can boast a very impressive £276. Not that he would, of course. Off to a good start against someone who I'm pretty concerned about. Lots of experience, very knowledgeable. I don't want to be led into a false sense of security. <laughs> they set forth from the south coast, hoping to see several shires en route to the West Country. Not to mention the West Midlands, and we'll conclude many miles and lots of shops later in the Cotswolds. Very nice. Getting used to the car now. I am. It takes a bit of getting used to. Yeah. But I tell you what, they're quality miles, aren't they? Not off. Today, our pair will hang out in both Hampshire and Wiltshire, but we start off in Hazelmere. The most southerly town in Surrey, where Paul, having been dropped off by his chum, gets first dibs. Hello. Hi, my name's Paul. My name's Nick. Very nice to meet you, Paul. Is this your place? It is indeed. Welcome to the Ark Stores. And, as the name implies, there's really quite a lot in here. More swords. They worked for Raj last time. Colourful, too. He does like his carpets and furniture. <laughs> this is a lovely Windsor chair. And it's got this lovely elm seat. An elm is the ideal wood to use for a seat because it's got a grain that's so ambiguous it runs all over the place. There's about 20 holes where these sticks drop down into it. If you did that with oak or pine, it would split because the grain is quite straight. But with elm, the seat won't split. That's why it's going to last two or three hundred years. And the seat was made by a bottomer, somebody who adds out that shape. You had a turner who turned all of the legs. You had a bender who steam bent all of the arms and you had a bodger who put the whole thing together and hence the bodge job. So four people were involved in making a Windsor chair. Just as it takes two to make a road trip. <laughs> so let's catch up with Raj. About to arrive at the village of Runfold and the Antiques Warehouse. Hmm. Quite a spring in his step, don't you think? Well, he does have £276 to spend, after all. I really like buying unusual things. And here's a nice old sailor's outfit. It's only got £30 on the ticket. It's not about the money on this occasion. It, this is a novelty item, but it is old and it is unusual. I mean, you don't see these old sailor's outfits everywhere. I think it's probably continental, maybe 20s. Hilary. Ah, oh, here's the proprietor now. Hello. 
Hello. Now, this purchase is not going to make you millions, I'm afraid, but it's a bit quirky, a little bit different. It's a sailor's outfit. What do you know about it? Well, when I bought it, somebody came along and said, oh, well, that's Swedish. OK. I don't quite know how they knew, but it's not English. And you've got £30 on the ticket. What would be your best price? Well, I've had it an awfully long time. Have you? So I can let you have it at a knockdown price of 15 Fantastic. I think at £15, I'm not going to quibble at all. I'm going to have it. We have a deal. See? Not exactly spend, 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 however. He still has a very handy £261 left. Any more? Well, this is really different. This is what I would call a cocktail tray. It's 1920s, very, very art deco. Baker-like, which is unusual. And it's got this marbling effect. That is so art deco. I can just see Hercule Poirot being served his drinks on, on this tray. He was also very keen on cocoa. There's 49 pounds on the ticket. Ideally, ideally, I'd want to get this for about sort of 25 to 30 pounds. That's really quite nice. I can see that adorning any sideboard in any home. Hilary? She's being kept busy today. I really like this cocktail tray. Now, you've got 49 pounds on the ticket. What would be your best price? How about 28, total rock bottom. Hillary, we have another deal. Good. Two purchases already. How about over in Hazelmere, where Nick has so far spent a far more restful morning? I like this a lot. It's full of colour, it's an embrace, it puts a smile on my face. And so does the price tag, £50, which means I might get it for 40 It's the kiss at Wuttenberg by the great political cartoonist James Gilray. She is a Prussian princess and he's the son of George III. I'd say this is early 19th century. It's a print. It's a copy of the original. It's not signed or dated, but I'd say it's around about 1815. That could be a buy. Yes, it could be a buy. It could be a buy. So, could that be a buy then? <laughs> it could be a buy. I feel really nervous. <sighs> Raj has put the pressure on. Crikey. Good job he hasn't a clue about his chum's latest spree, then. Anything else grab you? This is sort of circa 1880. And it is a Victorian souvenir. A little piece to take home from the Isle of Wight. Alum Bay, famous for its coloured sands. And I've been there, I've seen it, these different sedimentary levels. And it is a real work of art. It's also a paperweight. Priced at £75. This is immaculate. The image isn't damaged at all. The glass is in perfect condition. All of this glass was hand-blown as well. It's the most stunning paperweight you'll ever come across. Could I pick that up for 60 Well, there's one surefire way to find out. Nick, I've spotted this Victorian paperweight. Look, there's £75 on the ticket. What's the very best? Say 55. 55. There is something else I had my eye on, and it's that hand coloured engraving, early 19th century. There's 50 pounds on the ticket there. I think at a stretch I could go to 30 on that, Paul. Making 85 pounds in total. Could you give me an extra fiver off? <laughs> Why not? Could you do that? Let's do it. Call it 80 for the two. I'm going to say yes. Thanks, Nick. Five, six, seven, eight. My budget is disappearing. That is the idea. Now, with a Raj in Runfold, last seen hoovering up a sailor's jacket and a cocktail tray for a mere £43. No sign of stopping yet, by the look of it, either. This is what they call a pix, and really it's a container for putting the wafers in, which are known as the host, and it's for communion. And it's really unusual, and it's got its original little pouch with the crosses on it as well. Well, this is dated London 1959. £65 on the ticket. I like seeing things I've never seen before or never bought before, and this is certainly one of those items. It's silver, and silver at the moment is a good seller. It is risky, but I've got to take a few risks. This could be one of them. Hillary? No peace, eh, Hillary? I found this little communion silver pot that the wafers go inside. You've got £65 on the ticket. What would be your best price on that? I could probably come down to 35. 
At £35, Hilary, we've got another deal. Oh, good. So we've got 28 for the tray and we've got 15 for the sailor's outfit. And what does that come to? Oh, goodness gracious, you put me on the spot. I can't I do it just like that. It's 78, actually. Time to bid Runfold au revoir. He looks a bit like a maitre d', doesn't he? <laughs> so while the Mercedes whisks him away to buy yet more stuff, we'll spend some time with his buddy, enjoying a brief non-commercial break. In the nearby city of Winchester, where the 11th century cathedral still stands, thanks to the bravery of this man. David, good to see you. Nice to meet you, Paul, as well. I look forward to showing you around. David Farthing is a civil engineer and cathedral guide. When William the Conqueror came to the country, he immediately started building a number of cathedrals, and this is one of the greatest. Started in 1079, and remarkably, in only 14 years, it was complete. The problems arose from the fact that William the Conqueror chose to build his great cathedral on some poor ground at the bottom of the Itchin Valley. And the result is that after a number of years, this end of the building has begun to sink. And if you look up, you can see how this end slopes downwards. But Winchester's subsidence problems were made much, much worse by the decision, taken just over a hundred years later in 1205, to extend the cathedral. So you can see where the floor dips? The foundations of that construction were beech logs on top of peat. Those, not surprisingly, began to rot, so that by the early 20th century, the building was in danger of collapse. They called upon Francis Fox, a eminent civil engineer of the time who specialised in building foundations under water. And he said that the walls needed supporting with large timbers. He said the cracks should all be filled with cement grout. And when they started the actual underpinning process, which was a matter of digging pits beside the walls, they found that when they got down there, they were full of water, so they had to pump the water out before they could start building the new foundations. And there was so much water that the engineer, Francis Fox, had to think of something new. The solution he arrived at was to employ a man capable of getting much closer to those watery foundations, a deep sea diver, one William Walker. He was the man of the moment, and he had to don his diving gear and descend down into the murky water. Very brave. He wouldn't have been able to see anything at all. It was totally black down there, and he cleared all the peat from the top of this gravel, which created a nice, clean surface on which they could start to build a new foundation. And they did this by lowering down to him bags of dry mixed concrete. And he laid these side by side on the top of the gravel, sometimes two or three layers deep. And then within a few days, these bags of dry cement and concrete would set hard. Then and only then could they pump the water out without causing more problems. How long did it take him? Well, it took in all five and a half years. <sighs> He's a truly remarkable man. He's got a pretty big pair of shoulders on him, as you can see. Walker's work made Winchester stable. The cathedral now moves only millimetres over decades. His contribution, as well as that of engineer Fox and all the rest, was properly recognised. And over a hundred years later, this little statue is one of the most visited sites in the city. Oh, hang on. Hi, Paul. Hi, is that you in there? What's it feel like? It feels very, very heavy. I know it'd be slightly lighter underwater. He must have been a tough old cookie. Was. He must have been. Yeah. Tougher than me. And me. From the spiritual to the material world, Raj is looking awfully pleased with himself on Merck manoeuvres. 
Our early front runner is off to his second shop of the day in yet another cathedral city, Salisbury. Birthplace of James Harris, the music lover and friend of George Frederick Handel, who visited Salisbury in 1739. And there's Raj at the eponymous antiques market with an awful lot of hard cash in his pocket. I've still got around £200 and I want to spend it. I need something with three figures at least if I can and still to make a profit. We'll take it as red then. So what'll it be? There are some lovely things in this shop. This is a claret jug. It's, it's not silver, it's silver plate, but it's just a, a really lovely example. This is Bacchus here, the god of wine. Son of Semele and Jupiter. The handle is actually people harvesting the wine, which you don't often see, and it's really quite delicate. And the glass is all etched as well. It's clearly Victorian, probably dates between 1850 to 1870. It's priced at £240, but it's got some lovely detail. What stands out for me is the handle, which is just gorgeous. I've not seen one like that before. It's a little out of my price range, but I love it. Don't look, Bacchus. Was there a Roman god of jelly, we wonder? I'm drawn towards these, and these are a set of 19th century copper jelly moulds. They're nice shapes. And if I pick one up, you can have a look on the inside. They were lined with tin. The reason for that is that copper isn't actually that good for you, and it would wear off. And somebody would come round and reline them with tin, and that person was known as a tinker. Copper can react with acids, while tin is non-reactive but wears easily. These were made for the gentry of the time during the 19th century. You can imagine a big old farmhouse kitchen with these on the shelves and the cook making jellies. No ticket price. There's five of them. I'm going to speak to the owner. I, I really like them. Copper and shiny. That's me. Gird your loins. Hi, Pete. Hi, hi Raj. One thing I've been drawn to is the copper jelly moulds. Yeah, sure. What have you got on them? They're priced at £60 each. What about uh, if I offered you £100 for three of them? I can't do it. I'm sorry. No? I'd, What's, what I'll, would be the very best on three of them? I'll do them for 120. What about we split the difference and call it 110? Okay, all right. You sure? Yeah, sure. Fantastic. We have a deal. Thank you very much, Pete. That's very kind. Although it's still a substantial sum, he does get to take his pick, though. I wonder what Paul's going to think. Kitchen alia. Quite. Can't wait to share the info by the looks of it. Back to Hampshire tomorrow. It's where Henry VIII met one of his wives, Jane Seymour, down here. Didn't go very well, though, did it? No, it didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hope we have better luck in Hampshire. <laughs> Nighty night. Next morning, we're off to a bumpy start. Raj, I think we're lost. I don't know why you're smiling. You're supposed to be in charge. I you're know, smiling. I know. I took the okay. wrong turning, and I think this is getting narrower and narrower and bumpier and bumpier, and it's not the sort of car oh you dear. want to bring down a lane like this. Things were going so smoothly yesterday as well, with Paul plumping for a paperweight and a print. My budget is disappearing. He does still have almost 115 left, though, while Raj was even more prolific acquiring a sailor's outfit, a cocktail tray, a silver pix, and some copper jelly moulds, as you do. Copper and shiny, that's me. Which means he has £85 to spend today. And luckily, they seem to have found a slightly smoother road. How are you feeling shopping-wise, Raj? Not too bad, actually. Not that's too bad. worrying. I've got some bargains. <laughs> oh, help. <laughs> Calm down. Look, there's some new forest ponies. You may be seeing a few of those today whilst herring round Hampshire. But today's first port of call is Lyndhurst. Capital of the New Forest, where Paul has the antique centre all to himself. Not exactly well blessed in the ready cash department, of course. 
although those wishing to add a more positive spin could say he does still have over a hundred pounds. Not bad. There's a whole series of postcards here and some of them are signed. They're all of professional boxers. Gosh, some of these are quite rare. The boxers I've never even heard of. Some of them I have heard of. And there's Henry Cooper. You see, all of these boxers my dad would have watched on TV and I'd be watching them with him back in the late 60s and right through the 70s. Frank Bruno. There's Muhammad Ali, Cassius Clay. Joe Frazier, big Joe Frazier. Known as Smoking Joe. Some of them are signs and some of them will be incredibly rare. This is the kind of thing that if you put into auction and you got it online on all of those big search engines, collectors all over the world would love this kind of memorabilia. I'm going to find out how much these are, because I think... I think these would fly in auction. There's over a hundred, I would say, and even at three or four pounds each. That's three or four hundred quid. Hardly antiques, of course. And there's the price ticket underneath the bottom. It's £168 for the two volumes. Even if I got a bit knocked off, I still couldn't afford them. This is the one that got away. Never mind. There must be plenty of other contenders. See what I mean? I like the look of this. It's Victorian, it's typically French, but it's Egyptian revival and I love the sphinx on the top. This is slate with two-tone marble. Only needs winding up once a week and it would chime on the hour, so there you go. But it's not working, and I can tell you why it's not working. Because I've got the pendulum. I've got a key. Let's see if it works. Yeah. That's nice. It's working. It is missing, I think, two figures either side. It would have been part of a garniture piece designed for a mantle, the top of a fireplace in the parlour. And that's quite nice that that moves, actually, because Depending on where you enter the room, you can turn this around to face you. So it's got a commanding aspect. So the Sphinx now is facing you. All the energy is going that way. Might be wise to find out the price at this point, don't you think? Jason? Hello, Paul. Could you do me a favour and tell me how much this clock is? There's no price tag. Well, I could let that go for £50. Is that going to be any good for you? Is that your best? Well, if you were, if you were to say 40, then uh, maybe I would say 45. OK, well, you've just taken the words out of my mouth. <laughs> Should we say 45 pounds? 45 pounds. pounds. It's a deal, Paul. Text book negotiation by the shopkeeper. Thank you. Yes. Looks like it might not be the only deal today, either. I just think I've spotted the oldest thing in the store. It's got to be 50 million years old and a bit more. It's fossilised tree resin, that is amber. That's an even better piece, because that's the amber everybody wants, the sort of the darker reddish colour. It literally is the sap of the tree that's been fossilised over millions of years. And the bits to look out for, especially when buying beads and necklaces, are the bits that have insects, bugs, you know, trapped in it, immortalised. It's lovely. The oldest amber is over 300 million years old. It's really doubled its price in the last three or four years. It's on trend. I mean, this is sort of made up. It's not Victorian. I'd say that's 1930s. But underneath the dome like that, that looks like a lovely little curio. Time to consult Jason. Jason. Hello, Paul. How are you getting on? That's £30. That's £38. But I do like the little dome it comes under. OK. What's the very best on these two pieces of amber with its glass dome? OK, Paul, um, I'll do you one price, one price only, £45 for the lot with the dome and the two pieces of amber. Brilliant. I'm going to say yes. Thank you very much. OK, it's a deal. It's a £45 day, isn't it? <laughs> with a clock. So that's £90. £90, that's correct. And he still has 24 left for his last shop. Thank you, Paul, and good luck at the auction. Jason, thank you so much. And now, while he gets back on the road... Yes! Game on! Forgotten something? We'll journey to another part of the New Forest, close to the coast at New Milton. 
where his amigo has arrived at the Sammy Miller Motorcycle Museum to find out from Sammy about the brave bikers who play such a vital role in military communications, not to mention their mounts. This is probably one of the only surviving ones in the world. Wow. It's a First World War, 1914-18, Blackburn, designed and made by two brothers, the Burnley brothers, Cecil and Alex. They had two bikes requisitioned for the war campaign, 1914, and the two men decided they would join the war, the Fifth Royal Signals, and off they went to war with their bikes. Throughout the history of warfare, mounted dispatch riders have been important. But at the beginning of World War I, the War Department realized that two wheels could be a viable alternative to four legs although volunteers were asked to supply their own bikes. The dispatch riders who were really in the front lines of battles because there was very little radio contact in those days, so the signals had to be brought back manually to headquarters, getting the dispatch riders circulating all over the place so they could find out what was happening in the war. And the two brothers ended at the Battle at Mons, and luckily both the lads survived, but one of the bikes didn't survive because a friendly tank in the middle of the night ran over it. By the time of the Second World War, the motorcycle was recognised by both sides as a relatively cheap and agile means of transportation. With the bewilderingly large range of road machines now replaced by a limited number of purpose-built military models, this is the Norton 16H, a real workhorse. Quite amazing that the MOD were given Nortons like an order for 30,000 16Hs. Wow. And the number of bikes that were under MOD in the war was like hundreds of thousands. Unbelievable, you know. How reliable was the Norton? Oh, they were bulletproof. Strong engines, big engines, low revving engines, so they didn't wear out. And that was good for the dispatch riders when they were in muddy conditions in France. You notice on this one here too, you see the shield and the light? Mm -hmm. It kept the light down so that any planes going overhead couldn't dive bomb you. Sammy, a former motorcycle champion who excelled at all forms of the sport, including trials riding, can testify as to the skills and bravery required to drive at high speeds over rough terrain. Perhaps in recognition of the dangerous duties they carried out, dispatch riders were assigned the rank of corporal. They were also relatively well paid in comparison to other troops. And of course, they paid big attention to air filters for the desert. The army bikes that were used in the African campaign, they would have big special filters to keep the sand out of the engine because sand and engines don't work too good. No. Almost every single one of the bikes in the collection is still going strong, so that Sammy can still fire them up and put them through their paces. Looks the part, doesn't he? And would they have worn what you're wearing, a trench coat and a helmet like that? Yeah, I mean... this is a sort of gear, you know, quite well lined in the inside. You see the, the lining, world. quite warm, actually. I don't know how good it would be for keeping the rain out, but it would probably keep it out for a little bit. And so for every bike made, there was one soldier that was trained to ride that bike? That would be his bike, and he was honour-bound to maintain it, get familiar with it so that he could work at it, change the tubes if he got a puncture, fix the engine, and that was his domain. How does it make you feel being the custodian of all these bikes? Um, great honour, great honour. Yeah. Been a lucky person, really. When I was 10 years old, I was going to play motorbikes, and here I am over 70 years later, still playing motorbikes. Here, here. <laughs> Lovely. Meanwhile, on four wheels, well, you know, one for each corner, what's the mood in there? I've got my work cut out because I never realised how competitive Raj is. He freely admits it as well. He said, I'm a sportsman. It's ingrained. I want to win at all costs. Oh, sends the alarm bells ringing. There's still one more treasure unearthing opportunity to go, Paul, in the last shop of this leg at Ferndown. Just on the edge of the new forest. He's got in first, but his highly competitive comrade will be along shortly. 
plenty of choice at Bridge House Emporium, too. But when you've only got just under £25 left in your pocket, that may not be quite what you want to hear. Ah, here's Raj. Beat me to it. He certainly has. Looks like Paul's got his mitts on the white fries first, too. Look. Nice. It's called white fries because it's made in London, and the firm dates back to the late 18th century, and it was set up by James Powell. The company really took off at the Great Exhibition in 1851. They sold their wares to the world. This is classic English 20th century modern. It's art glass, and I love it. And the condition is very, very good. I felt the rim. There are no cracks. Isn't that lovely? What's not so lovely is the price. £40 is out of his reach. Oh, hello. <laughs> Looks like Raj has been inspired by his museum trip earlier. No motor. <laughs> Hi, Paul. Hello, Raj. Woo! Speedy Gonzalez. <laughs> is that your bike? No, it's not, Paul. I'm just using it to get round a little bit faster than you so that I can get the bargains. Oh, shrewd thinking. Have you found anything? Not yet, and I've only got about £25. I happen to have a little bit more cash than you. A bit more cash. Oh, good for you. Well, I'll see you, see you later. Yep. He's got £88 left. Anyway, get on with it. Both of you. Ah, shops in the military section, does he? I like this cat badge a lot. It's the Royal Scots Fusiliers. The regiment was active from the late 1600s right up until 1959, when they amalgamated with the Royal Highland Fusiliers. So there's a lot of pedigree. There's a lot of collectors out there that buy this stuff online, so you can easily find it if it's for sale in an auction room. Plus, it's much more affordable. Condition is key, and it is very, very good. It's got its back stick pin. Um, there are no dents. The impression is there, the line and the unicorn. I'm pretty sure it's Second World War. It's a shame it's not First World War. The scrolling at the bottom is slightly different on the First World War ones. Just a little bit different, and they're worth around about, well, just over £100. Whereas this one is 25 quid. That's its market value. Now, surely I could do a deal on that. <laughs> I think there's a very good chance. Oh, Pete. Oh, hi, Paul. I found a Royal Scots Fusiliers cat badge. Right. It's got 25 quid on the ticket. Yeah. What can I have that for? You can have that for £22.50. 10% off? Yeah. That's the deal? That's the deal. Great. I can afford that. Yeah, good. <laughs> and with that, he's done. Pete, there's £22.50. pence. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. Which just leaves the one. Well, how do you do? Now, this is really unusual. I'm always drawn to mannequins, but I've never quite seen one like this. It's made of metal. You can almost see, see right through it. I mean, whee! I reckon he's smitten. £45. I'm guessing it may be 1920s, 1930s, and even if you didn't use it as a mannequin, just as a decorative piece in your room. I mean, look at that. Whee! Well done, Raj. Uh, hands up for... Uh, oh. Oh, dear. I've just lost an arm. That back. Oh, both arms lost. Oh, dear. Well, we'll call the owner in and see what he says. <laughs> All breakages must be paid for. Jim? Yes, hi. Hi, Jim. I'm afraid I had a little accident with the arms. Oh, dear. Bit of armless fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, how old do you think it is? I got it from a Bournemouth dressmaker. She's had it since about the 40s or 50s, I think. Perfect. £45 on the ticket. What would be your best price? Um, do it for 30 for you. 30 At £30, we have a deal. There he goes again. Looks like there's now three on this road trip. Just two up front, though. Well, it's the end of the day, and it's now all down to the auction, really. I know, but what should we do this evening, Paul? Do you fancy another curry? Let me think about that, yes. <laughs> then, shut eye. Auction day door with our experts repairing to watch events in the splendid backdrop of Stoner Park. Paul, oh, welcome. You picked them, Raj. <laughs> this is stunning, isn't it? Yeah. Have you been here before? A couple of times, yeah, as a visitor. Beautiful. Yeah, how are you feeling, anyway? Relaxed, calm, collected. And if you believe that... <laughs> After shopping round Surrey, Wiltshire, Hampshire and Dorset, they've now notched up a trip into Oxfordshire. 
while their purchases have arrived at Churchill auctions for sale on the net, on the phone and in the room. Paul parted with £192.50p for his five auction lots, while Raj spent a little more, 218 for the same number of items. Let's hear what her suit auctioneer, Anthony Tinson, thinks will shine. A nice set of three antique copper jelly moulds here. There's one by Benham and Froud, which is an excellent maker of copperware. And there's also one with a military mark, which is very unusual. And we're hopeful they'll do well today. So we've got a nice alum glass base sand paperweight. It's a good proper antique dealer's lot again, this one. It's in really nice condition. The, the sand's not mixed up, which they do get after all these years. And it also has got the arch rock on it, which is now sadly no longer with us. Out of all the lots we've got in the sale, the mannequin is just really unusual and industrial. I've had a good look on the internet. I can't find any others like it, which is always good for auction. And I think it's going to do really well today. That sounds like fun. I can't wait. So, shall we push the button? I guess so. Go on then, here we go. OK, here we go. Paul's little cat badge gets us underway. They always do well, military. You don't need to salute me just at the moment. Maybe, maybe at the end. OK. <laughs> <laughs> Start it at 10 somewhere. Come on. Straight in at 25 on the net. Ooh. At 25. <laughs> hey, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, I nearly fell off the car. Well done. <laughs> at 25 it is. Looking for eight now. Are we all done on the net? All done in the room as well? We're going to sell to the net at 28 then. Gavel's gone down. 28 First pounds First item. On the line. And it's a profit. Hardly Waterloo, though. <laughs> More of a minor skirmish. Straight in at 28 quid. Fantastic. Now for the Navy. Raj's little sailor suit. Straight in at 10 on the net. Do we want 12 anywhere? Oh, dear. Do we want 18? 18 and 20 and 20 pounds. Two You're right. Five. 25 it is on the net. Do we want 8 anywhere? 28 in the room. Yes. Yes. Two at 28. Last chance at 28 pounds and selling at 28. Yes. That's brilliant. Consider it piped aboard. Good start for both of us. Yeah. Paul's next. Will his amber gamble pay off? And 25 straight in on the net. Do we want Great. eight now? Come on. 28 and 30. That's 30 we bid. 35 and 40. Yes. 40 bid. 45 and 50. Yes, haven't lost money. Haven't lost money. We're at 50. It is then last chance. And we're going to sell at 50. Hammers up and selling to the net at 50. It's a profit. It's only a fiver, but it's a profit. Quite. Sounds pretty competitive himself, don't we think? It's an OK result, but I'm not closing that gap. Next, the jelly moulds. Any collie wobbles, Raj? This, for me, is a bit nervy. Okay. We'll see what happens, though. Wobble, well... wobble, wobble, willy wobble. We're straight off and running on the net. We're up to 140, 150. At 150 on the net, looking for 160 whoa, now. Whoa. Internet's running whoa. away at 150, 160. New bidder, 170. At 180, looking for 90. 190. Let's round it up to 200 now. Yes, let's round it up. At 190. <laughs> 200, we've got. New bidder at 200, looking for 10. 210. 220, 230. At 230, looking for 40 now. 240. Two, this is now. brilliant. At this is absolutely brilliant. Lovely. Now. At 250, do we want 60? 250? 250. Hammers up. And we're going to sell at 250. Wow. Ding dong. Yeah. Hey, copper and shiny definitely pays for Raj. Well done, Mr Auctioneer. He did a good okay. job, didn't he? <laughs> he did. He did a great yeah. job. What's more, he has high hopes for Paul's paperweight. Straight in at 50 on the net. That's even better 50. than 50. Do we want Straight five? in at 50. Yeah, money back. 55 looking for 60 now. At 55 looking for 60 now. Selling at 55 then. A it's a fiver. That's becoming his default profit today. I'm not closing the gap, Raj. Don't worry about that. Hmm. Chicken feed, thinks Raj. Plus, if his cocktail trade does well, that gap might be about to grow. We're off and running on the internet up to 28. 28 we've got, do we want 30 now? 30 and 5 we've got. 30 at and 35 5? we've got, do we want 40? Oh. Good... At 35 it is, do we want 40 now then? Go on. We're going to sell to the net bidder at 35 then. Selling at 35. Do you know, he reluctantly wa he didn't want to put the hammer down. Well, I think, no, I think he thought it might be worth I... a bit more too. Ah, well, yet another nice result for Raj. 
I'd be happy with that. That's a good profit. Paul's cartoon is next. Can he clinch a bit of a comeback? On commission at 45, the internet's nice. out for now at 45. At 45, it is on my commission, 50 new bidder. I've got 55. Yes. I've got 55 bid. So I've got 60 on the book. Do you want five on the net? Come on. It's getting there. You should be well happy with this. This is going well. Pounds. Hammer's up. We'll sell at 60. That's a really good result. That's, That's a fantastic result. That's a really good result. Well done. Yeah. Things are definitely looking up. Yeah. I was really worried about that. Raj's silver pick. Expect wordplay. I might need some divine intervention on this one. <laughs> Say a quick prayer. Here we go. <laughs> We're straight in at 100 on the net. Looking for oh. 10 now. Oh, oh. Oh, we could be oh. at 100 looking for 110 now. 110 we've got. It's a nice thing, this, at 110. It's a nice thing. You, you tell them we're still auction here. <laughs> Selling, then, to the net bidder at 110. Well done. See? Surprise, surprise. So there's always a silver lining, Raj. There's literally, always a silver lining. Literally That's... a silver lining. Raj can do no wrong today, apart from his jokes, obviously. Whoa. That is a fantastic profit, again. Now, could it finally be big profit time for Paul? We're straight in at 120, 140 on the net, 150 with the ah. commission bid at 160, yes. over at 170 on the yes. Fantastic, Paul. 170 on oh, commission. brilliant. Wow. 180 now? Yes, come on. 170 looking for 180 now. 170 it is with my commission Come on. We're going to sell to the commission bidder at 170. I'm happy. Well done, Paul. I'm happy. Well done. There you I'm go. I'm happy. That's, that's a huge profit. I needed that. Sphinx a lot. <laughs> One of Raj's. Game on, eh? Game on. Game, game on. on. Game yeah. on. From mummies to dummies, the auctioneer's favourite lot. At the end of the day, it's a mannequin, but it's quite unusual. You know, the arms come off. I've got some chickens running around yeah, here. Hey, he's running. talking about his mannequin here, guys. I know, Let I me know. pay attention. Three commission bids on it, starting at 70. Eight, off and running on the net. 110, we're at the net. 130, 150. 60, I've got 170 on the book. Oh, you've book. got the Midas touch. At 170, do we want 180? 180 in the room. Oh, my commission bid is out now. Ooh, ooh, ooh. At 180 in the room. This is your last, last chance, then. Got a sell at 180. That's fantastic. Wow. Oh, I enjoyed Whoa. watching that, Raj. Whoa. I think we all did. A model end to a perfect day. So that's ten profits, five profits each. That's definitely worth celebrating. Quite. Paul began with £194.70 and, after auction costs, made a very large profit. So he now has £299.86p. Wow. While Raj, who started out with almost that much, made, also after costs, an even larger profit, which means he heads out onto the road with £552.46. and pence. I don't believe it. See you tomorrow, Raj. Drive carefully, Paul. I will. And don't spend all that money. <laughs>